I'm doing this short little summary before we play the Pippa Malmgren interview. The interview is actually over 40 minutes, and it had a lot of great, insightful content. Uh, because Pippa Malmgren has a PhD in economics, and she has contacts at the Federal Reserve and on Wall Street, and uh, she's now the CEO of a UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle or drone company, too. Uh, so her insights were great. Unfortunately, when the interview got to 22 minutes, something very weird happened. The quality of the audio, uh, when we were listening back on the recording, just went to total shit. I do not know why. Uh, when Pippa and me were actually recording the interview and talking, none of us heard any of the sound problems. And only going back and listening to the interview afterwards, before I posted it on YouTube for you guys, did I hear that at the 22 minute mark that things just got really wacky. Uh, I've had two very experienced audio editors listen to the interview and see if they could fix things after the 22 minute mark. But basically what happened is, you know, after 22 minutes, every second or two, there was just really loud, weird noises, almost a pattern. Uh, 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 the people who actually listen to the interview who have a lot of experience, they said they had never really heard st uh, pattern noises that loud before. It was very unusual. Uh, you know, maybe the NSA did put a backdoor into Skype. And, uh, you know, because Pippa is a prominent uh, person out there with good contacts and she was giving us good insights about negative interest rates and the inflation that's coming and all the other taxes... Uh, maybe that's why they decided to, uh, you know, they hit the they hit the buttons there and then just put in a lot of interference. But the problem after the 22 minute mark, we've cut the interview from over 40 minutes, unfortunately, down to 22 minutes. So I apologize. Uh, I was hoping for better, but you know, this just happened sometime, guys. And the problems were not with my microphone. So some of the things Pippa did bring up in the interview were about how. Uh, even Federal Reserve members, and these are not, you know, Janet Yellen's, these are people in the lower parts of the Federal Reserve, these are lower in the ranks, they admitted to her, they didn't, she didn't name names in her book, so I recommend you go read her book, Signals, that their models are broken. So these are Federal Reserve Bank members in Washington, D.C., who are saying that the cost of living inflation is much higher than their models show, they don't know how to fix their models to accurately show this, uh, it's obvious common sense how, how, how uh, you can fix your models to show this. Uh, instead of substituting in hedonics and geometric weighting, uh, they should just track a, back, a basket of fixed goods instead. But you know what their incentives are. So we, we discussed about the problem, how in society there are so many incorrect incentives problems. Uh, we touched on the uh, South Korean hygiene shipping going bankrupt and the uh, dollar losing sole world reserve currency with the RMB going into the SDR basket. I think, unfortunately, that part of the interview is also cut. We also talked about shrinkflation, which is where the food companies, uh, they keep the price the same at the grocery store, but they reduce the portion count by a lot. So the cost per unit rises. So we talked about that in inflation and uh, how a lot of people aren't aware of this, uh, especially, you know, government economists and a lot of people on Wall Street. So uh, there's a lot of great insights in the 22 minutes that you guys will listen to, but there was even more great insights after that. Uh, Pippa actually said that uh, during her PhD economics classes uh, where she was learning with central bankers that they actually did teach about negative interest rates. And they are only in very, very extreme measures. You, uh, the central bankers are only taught to use them if they cannot get inflation in uh, with other policy options. So the the people in power are going to get more and more desperate. Okay, guys, well, enjoy the interview. I just wanted to do this short little summary for you guys about some of the points she brought up that you won't get to hear. Um, hopefully, uh, there are not these sound problems on future interviews. We're going to do our best, but uh, this was not a problem with the microphone. There was definitely some problems that I don't think were involving my recording software, and um, it, it was probably... Unfortunately, some type of intervention. Hi, everyone. This is Jason Briarco of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I'm glad to have her back on. She is founder of the DRPM Group. She is the author of Signals, How Everyday Signs Can Help Us Navigate the World's Turbulent Economy. And she's also CEO of a drone and unmanned aerial vehicle or UAV company. Dr. Pippa Malmgren, thank you for coming back. Thank you for having me. 
Now, Pippa, I want to ask you about something that you talked about at length in your book, Signals, which is now available on Audible Audiobook. I really highly recommend our listeners go out there and buy the book. Uh, You talk a lot about broken models, both on Wall Street and at the Federal Reserve. Uh, Why do you think a lot of these academics and Wall Street uh, analysts and money managers are still clinging to these models? Well, the first thing is you have to understand we've had a generation or two now that believe that all the answers are in the math. You know, this deep abiding belief that numbers are the solution. But in the field of economics, you know, we've tried to make it into a science like physics. But the fact is human beings don't respond to things in the same way every time. And uh, so we introduced this idea of social behavior driven economics, behavioralist economics. But even that is very mathematical. It's looking for patterns of behavior. And all I'm saying is that if you were to add in narratives and anecdotes and the story, then you begin to see signals that tell you something about the future, whereas all these things tell you exclusively about the past. Models, math, algorithms, um, any kind of database thing, it's only about what happened before. So if you're brought up in that priesthood, as it were, it's considered you know, completely sacrilegious to suggest that there's any value in a signal that you can't quantify. But here's one that's interesting. Probably the most important factor in the world economy today is the incredible level of pain and anger about the losses that have been incurred in recent years due to the financial crisis. Now, show me a way to actually put a number on that. You can't, but you can show lots of behavior that represents that pain and anger, including the business of you know, electing, trying to elect to office people that have never been in office before, you know, get me somebody new because the old guys aren't delivering. So bottom line is I worked in, you know, the U.S. government and the White House, and I understand very well the Fed's business of being wedded to their models. But it's equally true that they don't have any means of incorporating the non-quantifiable elements. And further than that, most of their models were created based on Um, ideas in the 70s and the 80s. And frankly, I'm not sure they still apply. That was a world where the Berlin Wall fell and we had huge disinflationary forces. And so they started to remove inflation from the equation. And actually, it isn't dead. It's actually making a return. And they kind of don't know how to put it back in. I'll finish with this. I had one of the board members of the Federal Reserve Bank sit down with me over lunch and said, Pippa, I live in Washington, D.C., I can see what is happening to my cost of living. It is up, up, up. Our models are not reflecting this. What do you think is wrong with our models? And I'm like, oh, my God, if you don't know, I don't know. But at least (laughs) we agree that there's something skew if. There's something not quite right. When everybody is talking about their rising cost of living and the Fed says you're imagining it. Yeah, I completely agree. I actually live right outside of Washington, D.C., too. And my bills, like the everyday things like rent, health care, food, utilities, these things are all going up 8 to 12 percent per year, basically, if you live right outside of Washington, D.C. So the Federal Reserve's models are broken, in my opinion. I don't trust those models anymore. And, you know, I think those models caused the 2008 financial crisis because a lot of these Wall Street investment banks, you know, they had that variable at rate at uh, VAR or variable yes. at risk in their model and their models were telling them that well housing prices have never gone down before like you said so they were only judging by the past that there had never been a huge like countrywide housing crash so uh you know when there was a house uh huge housing wide uh countrywide housing crash the leverage in the system no one had the collateral and you know everything just went totally kaput very quickly i remember actually a friend of mine was uh working in central banking circles at the time and they were in a meeting with jean-claude Trichet, and he was asked exactly this, and he basically said, but we have no model for that. <laughs> yeah, you're like, well, you may not, but the American public, the world public are going to experience that. So, you know, this is the thing. We, we understand in, you know, in theory uh, what's going on, but it's very different from what happens in practice. The models you know, they, the economists approach it the other way. They said, well, uh, let's, it works in practice. Let's see if we can make it work in theory, right? <laughs> so they kind of approach it back to front. 
Well, I'm more of a common sense, you know, Austrians go free market. So F.A. Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, I look at human action rather than so there's so many complexities in the economy. You really can't accurately model anything for any period of time at all because there's so many different variables that are changing. Now, well, I want to ask can you, I actually can I throw in just one thing on this because I think it's really interesting. And that is what about the deliberate effort to keep the public out of this conversation? Now, that's a very challenging thing to say, but my father was the economic advisor to Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. He was Tom Schelling's research assistant, the guy who won the Nobel for game theory. He worked with Sir John Hicks, who won the Nobel in 72 for economics. And so my dad always said, look, you have to understand that for economists, they're mainly mathematicians. And an easy way to keep Congress out of the conversation and debate is to add math because they simply can't keep up. The minute you put any math into the conversation, they all go, oh, well, well, you, you I defer to your expertise. And I do think that we have a lot of deference to expertise uh, that the public is only just beginning to challenge and say, wait a minute, why are we trusting the so-called experts? Because they haven't got it right. But the reality is experts like to use these sorts of methods to keep the general public from asking pointed questions. That's a great point. And I think, you know, they just basically keep doubling down like Paul Krugman when, you know, there was a housing crisis. Oh, we didn't do enough stimulus or quantitative easing. We have to keep doing more. And that seems to be some of the policy uh, decisions that are being written by guys like John Williams of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank. He's talking about inflation targeting now. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're, at, we're really uh, what's your opinion then of negative interest rates? Because you're a Ph.D. economist. Were you ever even taught about negative interest rates in school? You know, I was actually. Um, and let me tell you this. The simple truth is the whole purpose of negative interest rates is to create inflation. It is to make it so painful for you to hold your money in cash that you'll say, oh, well, it just makes more sense to go buy an apartment or to invest my money in the stock market or put it somewhere where I can get a return. So to say that negative interest rates are you know, unknown and untested, no, that's not true. We've seen negative interest rates in history. We know exactly what the purpose is for. And that's exactly what central bankers are telling us. By the way, recently, uh, um, Charles Goodhart, who's a highly respected economist from the Bank of England, and Andy Haldane, who's on the board of the Bank of England, both came out with papers saying we should move to electronic cash much more quickly. And the reason is not because we want more convenience for the consumer. No, it's because we can impose negative interest rates more aggressively because if you have 100 bucks in your bank account and it's electronic – the regulators or the Fed or whoever can literally just take $2 out overnight, and now you're down to 98% of what you had. That's a negative interest rate with bite to it. And that is the way they're thinking is the way we'll force you to go buy something of value in the economy is to deduct it from your bank account. So this is the logic. Wow, that's that's scary logic to someone like me who believes, you know, cash and savings are freedom, that if you have cash and you pay for something in cash, you know, you're not taking interest on a credit card. So uh, it's scary to me that a uh, government would want to take this tax immediately to force you from saving. Well, and how ironic that we live in a world with a terrible debt problem and governments want to penalize you for saving. Hello. Well, I, I think this goes back to – you mentioned this in your book, Inflation versus Deflation, This is and Saltwater versus Freshwater. This is free market mm -hmm. economics versus Keynesian or interventionist economics. You know, savings and investment, and you talked about this in your book too, along with innovation, you have to have savings before you can start making investments into innovation and things like that. So, right. uh, you know, I, I don't know – how the people in power think that they can improve the real economy. Maybe it's just the politicians trying to force the wages higher and they think that that will <laughs> fix things. <laughs> well, you know, this is, again, a, a very central issue. Uh, that, and, and you referred to my freshwater, saltwater configuration. And just to explain that, rather than talking just about left and right or conservative and liberal or Democrat or Republican, the question is how much um, – intervention do you think is required by government to sort out any given problem in the economy? And people who are saltwater typically come from the Harvard, Princeton, Yale, East Coast academic environment who think that you can take a few incredibly smart people and put them in a wood paneled room in Washington, D.C., and they will figure out 
what the right solution is. And there's, you know, that's the whole tradition of John F. Kennedy's best and the brightest, right? My dad was one of those guys who got in, called in precisely because he was so smart and, at math. But the other view, which is considered freshwater, comes from Chicago and near the freshwater Great Lakes, which is there is no amount of brilliance in any one person or small group of people that can begin to match the incredible brilliance of the open market that allocates wealth and assets based on, you know, buyers and sellers. And that the solution is more freedom for the market to operate as it should and less intervention by government or, you know, by a plan. And so this is the question. Do we want planning or do we want markets? And in today's environment, people are understandably irritated with markets and capitalism and they feel it hasn't delivered or it hasn't delivered what they wanted. And I think to some extent that they have a reasonable gripe there. Um, but the solution isn't necessarily that there's some smart guy in Washington who can figure this out or that there's a plan that makes sense. And I think this goes back to our philosophical question about what is capitalism versus what is socialism or if you like communism. And I think part of this could be resolved if we had less what I would call corporatist capitalism, the kind of capitalism that seems to exclusively benefit really big corporations, often the ones that can game the system very aggressively, but doesn't work to the advantage of anybody running, you know, a household or a small business. And this is not the kind of capitalism that I think works. I prefer the small business, small government version of capitalism. But in that world, you have to think about things like the tax code. Now, the tax code is so long, nobody's ever read the whole thing. Nobody really understands what's in it anymore. But big companies can hire the best lawyers to game the tax code. And that's how you end up with these headlines about Apple paying, you know, zero tax in, or virtually zero in a place like Ireland. But little companies, they have to pay all of it. In fact, they'll misinterpret or they'll make mistakes. They'll have to pay penalties, you know, or over the rate because they weren't devoted enough to this issue because they don't have the resources. And so what happens is you penalize the very parts of the economy that are most capable of growing, which is firms that employ less than 50, 50 people. But you put to advantage the big companies that you know can basically work around the rules. So I guess the freshwater salt water was a way of saying it's not a question of capitalism versus socialism or communism. It's a question of the type of capitalism, and I personally prefer not big business, big government, but small business, small government, but there are lots of configurations of that, and people need to think what is their personal philosophical preference. Yeah, I think that uh, you mentioned their uh, incentive problems. I think there's incentive problems throughout the entire society. You know, we have this new case that just came out with Wells Fargo Bank, where yes. 53 where 5,300 employees were busted for fraud. They had a perverse incentive structure inside the company, you know, to create all these fake accounts, to cre commit all these counts of felony fraud, to get extra bonuses. I think the person in charge of that division is walking away with $125 million in bonuses. I don't know if any of these guys, bankers, will be busted for felony fraud. Uh, so how do we fix all these things then uh, and still keep small governments? Well, I think this is a very profound question and a problem to resolve. Um, and one of the things I talk about in the book is something called the social contract. And by that, I mean there's always a deal, a contract between citizens and their state. And the citizens agree to pay their taxes and abide by the law. And in exchange, they expect their government to deliver certain things like, you know, paved roads and a school system for people who are low income and, you know, health care of some nature or another. And what we have today is a breakdown of this social contract precisely because Governments are broke because of the debt problem, and they can't deliver on their promises, but they're saying to people, we're going to tax you much more in order to pay for all these debts that we have. And people are saying, wait a minute, that's not serving my interests. So what we need is to renegotiate that social contract. The question is, how does that get done? Now, in places that don't have a strong ballot box, emerging markets, um, what we see is social unrest spills into the streets and people basically throw their leaders out 
and they bring in new leaders and they change the rules of the game that way. That's what happened in Tunisia at the very beginning of the Arab Spring, for example. And uh, to be honest, I think that Tunisia ended up with a better social contract than they had before, right? The old one was one guy got all the money, the, the leader of the nation, and everybody else got nothing. Well, obviously, that was not working very well, although they tolerated it for 30 years. But in the place like the United States or Britain or Europe, you have the privilege of a ballot box, and you're able to exercise your vote to begin to change that social contract if you don't like it. And people are pulling that lever. That's how we got Brexit in the United Kingdom. Uh, that is how we're beginning to see uh, the emergence of Donald Trump in the United States. People are saying, I want a different deal than I had before with my government. Now, is that enough to just change the leadership? Probably not. So we need to have a whole group of citizens begin to say, okay, this is not working. What would be a better way to go? And that's a bit why I wrote the book was to is encourage people to understand that whatever the system is, you are a part of it and you can either tolerate it, which in which case you implicitly condone it, or you can say, no, this is not working for me and I choose to exercise my political voice and come up with something that's better. Yeah, Pippa, the emerging markets uh, really since uh, 2009, when all the stimulus programs were injected by the Federal Reserve in China, they had an enormous amount of inflation because their monetary policy was tied with currency pegs. So, uh, you know, that inflation, that's what caused unrest. Uh, you mentioned in the book yes. about the food prices going up. Uh, you mentioned shrinkflation a lot in the book. For our listeners who are not familiar, what exactly is shrinkflation? Yes. Okay. So, like I said, everybody tells you there's no inflation whatsoever. The only issue you have to worry about is deflation. And yet, what happens is you wake up in the morning, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but you go to brush your teeth, and the size of the aperture on the toothpaste tube keeps getting wider. And the reason is because there's a whole division of most personal product companies that make toothpaste to finding ways to get the consumer to use more of the product faster in order to be able to charge you more for it over time. Uh, you can see it when you open your box of breakfast cereal, that the box is the same size as it ever was, and you paid the same price as you ever did, but when you open it up, there's only like half as much cereal in that sucker, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> I think it's people really, air. yeah, it's all air, it's compressed air. Actually, I think a big signal is the bang that the bag makes when you open it, because that tells you how much compressed air is in there, which has weight and permits them to be able to say they sold you eight ounces. So why is it called a shrinkflation? It's a, basically an, a precursor, an early indicator of inflationary forces in the economy. It's telling you that companies are feeling margin pressure and the costs rising. So to pass that on to cost the cost to you, the consumer, in order to protect their own margin and revenue and performance of the company. But if you see enough shrinkflation, you cannot be surprised when the inflation number actually starts to go up. So I'm just saying it's a signal. You should pay attention to it. It probably indicates you're going to be paying higher rent at some point in the future, which, by the way, we all are. Yeah, the cost per unit of a lot of these items at the grocery store has just been going up for a very, very long time. Yet when you talked with people at the Federal Reserve or the Bureau of Labor Statistics who are supposed to record these things, you know, they say, well, I go to the grocery store, I'm, a, I'm an intern, I'm assigned to go to Target or Walmart or the grocery store and copy down the prices of the items. The price stays the same. They miss that what the companies are actually doing. The companies are not like, uh, you know, at the grocery store, they're hiding it. But, you know, on conference calls, they're admitting it. They're admitting that their inputs yeah. are rising and that they're, you know, to uh, they're offering uh, less value for the consumer to maintain their margin. So it's not like they're totally lying about it. Not only that, but you can see it every day. Just open any financial press article and you will see how many companies are falling short of their targets due to, quote, rising costs. You're like, hello. How much more obvious does this need to be to anybody? 
Okay, well, I want to ask you now, I want to transition and ask you about another question. This is a current event. We've had the South Korean Hanjin Shipping Company uh, yes. file bankruptcy. They're the seventh largest shipper in the world. Uh, what signal do you think that says about the global economy, about one of the largest shippers in the world going bankrupt? Well, I actually think it may not tell us a lot. It may be that they just had bad management of their business. It may be that they were suffering from the same debt overload as everybody else has. Uh, it, what I think will tell us more is when we see who buys it and at what price. That probably is a better indicator of what the underlying business looked like. The fact is we have had a dramatic decrease in global trade, and they probably built their whole business model on the assumption that everything was going to be fine. That's what usually happens. So does that mean that there's no business to be had in providing global shipping services? No, it just means this particular company with their management misjudged it, and now somebody else needs to come in, buy it at the correct price, and manage it with the correct margins, which I suspect will happen. Global trade isn't going to stop just because one company came to an end, even though it's a big one, uh, and it's a nasty logistical problem. But it doesn't mean there is no money to be made in global trade. Yeah, I agree. There's, as long as there's not another world war, there's going to be uh, opportunities, uh, even in any crisis, uh, for entrepreneurs to go in there and solve problems.